Welcome to episode two of The Power of Now What, a series of podcasts on overcoming the various challenges one encounters when engaged in a process of awakening, a process of spiritual development such as meditation, and even the problems that one might encounter post-enlightenment or post-the-awakening experience. I wanted to speak on the issues and problems that arise from my personal experience. And these are also the common questions, queries and challenges that are presented to various spiritual teachers. Uh, So I wanted to just give my take, my perspective and hopefully present some solutions to these common issues. In this episode, I want to discuss work, the problem of work the problem of how to overcome the various difficulties and challenges that work presents from a spiritual perspective, and in particular, the unique challenges that arise as you become more spiritually aware, as you begin to awaken to the truth of reality. So in my experience, I have the deep realization that it's only ever the present moment. It's only ever now. There is no future. There is no past. There is only now this ever present, eternal, infinite moment. Alongside this, I've experienced the dropping away of the ego. Not fully just yet, but it's dropping away. The sense of being an individual, temporary, finite, separate self begins to dissolve, begins to fall away, and instead a deep recognition and realisation that one is in fact the infinite universal consciousness that we all share, and the, the ego, the sense of being a person, is actually an illusion as the infinite universal consciousness has condensed itself into this temporary character in order to experience itself, in order to have the experience of being temporary and finite, and to, it's a function of consciousness itself in order to forget its own nature in a sense, to be immersed fully in a, well, to be immersed fully into a film or immersed fully into watching some entertainment is to forget yourself and to become fully invested in the various characters, games and and plays that we entertain ourselves with. This is what universal consciousness does. It condenses down into a singular entity and then forgets that it did this. (laughs) So I had this profound realization, and then realized with a great deal of disappointment that I still have to go to work, that there was still such a thing as Monday mornings, and I was still going to endure the pain of all of the stresses and strains that work provides. So I want to do an episode just going through... um, the issue of work, the problem of work, and uh, what happens as we begin to spiritually awaken, what happens to our working life. Because after all, work is one of the main sources of stress, pain, suffering in our lives. A lot of people feel quite happy when they're at home. I mean, you're comfortable, you have your entertainment, you have your, you have, uh, you have plentiful access to food, you're comfortable, it's warm, it's safe, and nobody's bothering you. Well, maybe it depends if you have a family or not, but for most people, they say they're fairly happy and at peace anyway, as long as they're at home. But then this thing called Monday morning comes around and they have to go to work and are subject to all of the stresses, strains, pains and discomfort that work 
uh, provides that worker places upon you. And enlightenment and awakening spiritual development promises that this this the suffering associated with with life with work will diminish and will dissolve and there are many people who get into meditative practice and spiritual practice as a method of coping with and overcoming the stresses the anxieties the worries and strains of working life I mean, we've all had the experience of uh, the Sunday scaries, this phenomena where you've enjoyed your weekend and managed to begin forgetting your problems for a while. But it's Sunday evening and you're becoming very aware that Monday morning is about to arrive. And we all have this feeling, this pit in our stomach, this this sinking feeling, this dread of Monday morning is is looming on the horizon or even wait your alarm clock goes off you wake up on Monday morning and uh, you just feel this horror and don't discount this don't discount this feeling it's it's very real we often dismiss this and sort of laugh about it like oh it's just Monday morning it just is what it is but you know that feel it's a horrible feeling it's a true feeling of despair a real feeling of horror and a lot of time we get into meditative practice to overcome this feeling on a Sunday evening. The best thing you can do is meditate because when you're fully immersed in the present moment, you realize there's no such thing as Monday morning. There are, there are no days. There is no time. It's just now. It's only ever now. Um, so when, when you, get into the meditative state for this purpose. It's enormously relaxing. It's very, very powerful. So what's the, uh, what what happens? What's the post awakening problem here? Well, as you begin to awaken, your priorities begin to shift and your perspective on life begins to shift. After all, if you have spent a long time meditating in order to overcome the anxieties and stresses of work, it's not long until you start questioning, well, why, why am I bothering going into work anyway? Why, why do I, the, the insight that arises is, well, hang on a minute, why am I even doing this in the first place? And you, as you begin to meditate, you begin to become very aware of the conditioning that you've been subjected to your entire life and you begin to realize that if you if you had completely free choice there'd be no way you'd be going to work <laughs> it's just a a a fact of life that has in a sense you realize that you've kind of been on autopilot for a very long time and you begin to recognize and realize the conditioning that influences your behavior, that influences your ideas, and uh, influences your belief. And no wonder this conditioning is there and a very strong and powerful force in you, because it's been going on since day one. When you're a child, all you really want to do is, is go and play outside in the sun, play with your friends. And then the school bell goes, <laughs> and um you have to sit down, they put a piece of paper in front of you and they go, no, no, this is, life is very, very serious and uh, you must do this thing called work. There is work to be done. And when you're a child, I, I had this experience, I don't know if anyone else has, but there's kind of, there's a great deal of questioning that goes on when you're a child, that at some point you stop questioning when you're a lot younger, you start saying, but why? Why do I have to go to school? It, it's not fun. It's very unpleasant. And the teachers spend a great deal of time and energy and effort trying to convince you of why, <laughs> why it's important, why it's necessary. But this completely goes against your natural inclination <laughs> to get away from all that. 
But the teachers and all of the adults in your life seem so earnest about this and seem so serious about this that um, you begin to, well, you begin to go along with it. And at some point you forget all about your, uh, the freedom. You forget all about your natural inclination towards being joyful and carefree. And instead you get suckered into this trap as well. The conditioning of, oh yes, there's this very awful thing called the future coming and uh, you'd better toe the line or, um, or it's going to be, it's going to be curtains for you. And what begins to happen so this is as you begin to meditate and as you begin to become spiritually more aware, you begin to become aware of the conditioning that you've been placed under your entire life. Because as you as you separate out from your individual ego, your individual temporary self and become consciousness, the consciousness itself isn't conditioned. The consciousness itself can see the conditioning, but isn't conditioned itself. And this naturally begins to diminish your conditioning. And as your conditioning begins to diminish, naturally, you're going to begin questioning, why do I <laughs> live my life like this? Why, do, why am I living my life on this autopilot mode? Do I not? You begin to remember your freedom. You begin to remember your choices, your liberation. And naturally, as work is a source of stress and pain, naturally, you begin to question, well, why do I bother at all? Then you become aware alongside this. So you begin to become aware of your conditioning. And alongside this, as you meditate, you begin to lose your fear and you begin to lose your desire. So one of the main, this, this is how the mechanism of conditioning works in the first place. You can only be conditioned. You can only be manipulated through your fear and through your desire. These are the only two ways that you can be conditioned or manipulated. We have fear about our physical we have physical needs and so we are afraid that if I don't work I won't be able to feed myself I won't be able to uh, live within shelter within a home within a house we fear that we if we don't work we won't be able to take care of our physiological needs that's quite a base primal sort of level that we feel fear on a deeper emotional level we feel this fear that, well, what if I don't live up to my potential? What if I miss out on life because <laughs> I make the wrong choices? I need to know what the right choices are. What if I make the wrong choice? What if I go down the wrong path? And we begin to fear on, a, on an emotional level. What if I don't get the life that I want? And that also brings us then to desire. The other way that you can be conditioned and the other way you can be manipulated is you desire, well, if I live up to my potential and I, I do the right work and make the right choices, I will be rewarded uh, with material rewards. I'll have more money and therefore I'll have better surroundings. I'll live in a nicer place. I'll have access to a broader range of experiences more luxurious experiences. I'll have access to more pleasure, and I won't uh, won't be uh, I won't I won't suffer from poverty or deprivation. I'll have a more <laughs> I'll have a nicer and more attractive uh, partner. There's that sort of uh, you know that primal desire that comes in as well. And our desire to start a family and, and things um, of that nature, our desire to be able to provide for ourselves and for our family. And as you begin to awaken spiritually, because consciousness does not have fear or desire, consciousness just is. It's just here watching and observing all the time at every moment. And so it has no desire and it has no fear. And as you begin to realize this is what you are. You are consciousness. You don't have any desire. You don't have any fear. 
you begin to question on a very deep level, well, what am I going to do about work? Because fear and desire, I mean, <laughs> how can you worry about your fear going? It's a paradox. There are many paradoxes, but it's true. It's kind of scary when your fear and your desire begins to fall away, because these are the pillars that you orientate yourself in life with. These are the the uh, the guidelines for your life. Aren't we supposed to avoid that which we fear and move towards that which we desire? Your entire life, you have been making choices and decisions we believe, based on this. And so when this genuinely, genuinely begins to disappear, you start to go, huh, well, now I feel a little bit like I'm in free fall. Because how do I, how do I orientate myself to this world? Uh, What if I forget the rules? What What are the rules of the game again? So from the meditative perspective, And as your consciousness begins to arise and you lose this fear and desire and you begin to question, well, why, why bother going to work in the first place? (laughs) This, this is the challenge that I want to talk about. This is the post awakening problem, because if you no longer have any fear, well, won't I simply forget to go to work? Won't I just stop going to work and, and therefore won't be able to afford to buy food? and and pay my rent this is just a a common the common trap that keeps people stuck and it comes up all the time people feel trapped and stuck they feel they have to go to work because they have to earn money because they have to pay rent because they have to buy their groceries and because they think if they keep working if you just work hard enough eventually You're going to hit, um, you're going to hit a point where you're finally happy. You finally achieve, you finally earn the reward. So what is the spiritual approach to this problem? How do we overcome the problem of work? Well, let's take a look at throughout history, the people who have had spiritual awakenings and overcame the problem of work by simply jacking the whole thing in because <laughs> it does happen um the the idea that uh due to spiritual reasons i don't want to play anymore i don't want to be a part of this game i'm fed up with the the snakes and ladders of it all i see that the game is rigged and i don't i just don't want to be involved and what are the spiritual Uh, people that do this the first people that I want to speak about is the monks and these are people who in in various cultures various societies various uh, ways that we've organized ourselves there have been people who give up the material world they they relinquish the all of the luxuries and indulgences of life, including marriage and uh, alcohol, drugs, sex, even rich food and uh, comfortable surroundings. They give up all of this. They renunciate this in order to pursue a spiritual endeavor. And there are many people uh, who do this. And throughout history, we've had a place for these people Uh, various monasteries and temples and places where people can go if they've given up the material world in order to pursue spiritual endeavors. And monks often live in very austere surroundings. They often live in very bare places. Often these monasteries are purposefully quite cold, uh, quite devoid of, of decoration. Uh, Even the food they eat is quite bland. It's purely there for the nutrition. It's not there for, um, it's not there for enjoyment. It's just there to sustain yourself. And often these monks just spend a very long time in meditation and prayer. And 
the thing about monks is the curious thing about monks is that there isn't a great deal of difference between the life of a monk and the life of a prisoner. <laughs> and um even down to, I mean, the Buddhist robes, the colour of the Buddhist robes are purposefully that colour because they're the same colour as the criminal. And if you think about the orange and red jumpsuits of the American prison system, there, there's not really a great deal of difference between that and the Buddhist robes. And the, the idea, the principle behind this is that these are people who have stepped out of society they're no longer a part of the system so that's what there's it's just a fantastic analogy it's just really interesting that both um i mean a prison is a type of monastery and a monastery is a type of prison in many ways and um it it's fallen by the wayside in modern times and i think that's a great tragedy really i think it's quite sad that we haven't provided an option for people who genuinely decide that actually I, I just don't want to be a part of this. I'm not, I don't desire all of the things that life promises and I don't fear being uncomfortable and being in pain. And I would rather pursue a spiritual endeavor in Times gone past, this was a far more accepted uh, path that people could take. And that often if it was if somebody truly decided I'm going to they often take oaths and uh, make vows to say I, I'll never um, be married. I'll never uh, drink alcohol. I'll never take drugs. And instead, I take up these vows and they take up vows to simply live a spiritual life. And that's the monk. And the monk is one method of overcoming a, a spiritual method of overcoming the problem of work. Now, obviously, that, that, that lifestyle doesn't appeal to a great, a great many people. And statistically speaking, you're listening to this podcast uh, whilst in the car commuting to work and um i imagine if you're listening to this podcast you probably live a fairly fairly comfortable life as it is and the prospect of being a monk just doesn't appeal and it doesn't appeal to a lot of people a lot of people who awaken spiritually don't go off and be monks they don't go and live in the woods i mean as, incidentally as a side note how often do you hear this sentiment how often do you hear people who have had a very hard day, who have had a very hard week, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm done with all of this. I just want to go and get a cabin and live in the woods and live a simple life. Everyone's had that urge at some point, and that is the urge of the monk. That's that very same urge. You are intuiting that um, this whole system, this whole game, uh, causes a great deal of pain. And actually, would, wouldn't, isn't there another way? Isn't there a more simple way of living your life? That's the urge of the monk. That's one way of doing it. And if you have that urge and that desire, then do it. Do it. It's, 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 you can still do it. In Eastern cultures, the monks are actually very well respected and very well revered. They're seen as people who are taking care of the spiritual aspect of life. And all the uh, lay people, all the common folk can go and do their work and um, even do all of their sin. Just get involved in all the usual, um, all the usual ups and downs of material life. And it's the monks that will take care of the spiritual side of things. We don't have to bother with our <laughs> spiritual stuff because there's all these uh, monks up on the hill, these monks and nuns, and they're going to take care of the spiritual stuff. And in a way, the monks clear the karmic debt. So they clear their own karmic debt and then they, they begin to clear the karmic debt from the, the common stock, uh, the general karmic debt of humanity. And there are many practices that monks take that have no purpose in the material world, but purely take care of the spiritual world. And that's the path of the monk. It's one way of overcoming the issue of work. Another group of people that uh, it's just quite interesting to note is the idea of the shaman, the idea of the witch doctor. 
and this is more common in tribal societies uh, and when we were in smaller villages. The shaman is somebody who is seen to have a connection to the other side. For some reason, I mean, the Aborigines speak a lot about the dream world and might have a witch doctor that, that can communicate with the world that we go to when we dream, except that they can communicate with this world in the waking state. And these are often seen as people who are in commune with the spirit world, in, in commune with the nature spirits, who have some form of uh, always communication, but sometimes even influence. And so these are people that you would go to, sometimes the, the wise woman in the forest, the medicine woman or the medicine man the wise people who went off to live on the fringe of society. They're often seen as weird or eerie or, or mystical, or they're often seen as, you know, they, it's not just the good spirits they commune with. It's the evil ones too. And they're often viewed with suspicion and they live on the fringe of society, but they're the person that you go to when you have a problem when you have a deep problem, when you feel like it's a spiritual issue, if you felt like there's an evil spirit that needs to be warded off or protected against, these are the people you would go and see. It's the shaman. But the trade-off with the shaman is that they they can't live within the, the castle walls. They don't live within the safety of society. They don't get to enjoy all the usual trappings of uh, of usual life. Instead, they have to go and live in the forest. And they are still well provided for. They are still respected, uh, sometimes worshipped and sometimes even feared. And the trade-off there is that, uh, yeah, they don't get the safety of the tribe. Um but they also don't have to do, do the work of the tribe either. They don't have to go hunting and they don't have to forage, uh, forage in the fields. So that's the monk and the shaman. And let's say, so you've arrived at some form of spiritual awakening, but you don't really fancy the path of the monk or the shaman. And in many ways, you've decided that actually, although Yes, there is a, a great deal of pain and discomfort associated with work. You don't want to give up work altogether. After all, you've worked hard to be where you are. You have a deeper intuition and understanding that your skills, your natural talents and your experience is actually of great benefit to the world. If you can, um, if only you could overcome the individual suffering that you endure as a result of bringing this work to the world. But you may well have very reasonably decided, yes, I'm, uh, I'm awake, <laughs> I'm conscious, I am universal infinite consciousness, but I want to continue working. And in many ways, if you had the option to stop working, you wouldn't want to stop working. On a strange roundabout kind of way, you actually enjoy it. You enjoy the work itself. You just don't enjoy all of the suffering <laughs> that surrounds it. The suffering of all the office politics. The suffering of being told how to do your job when actually you know how to do your job. The suffering of co-workers getting in the way. The, <laughs> the suffering of, of seeing uh, malpractice of seeing uh, people doing the job badly and uh, when we come to spiritual awakening we come to a deepening of consciousness we begin to think well how can I continue to work and yet alleviate the suffering associated with my fear and my desire so let's say you decide the game is worth the candle and you want to keep playing. <laughs> you're, you're quite, you, you've recognised that this is a game of snakes and ladders, that it's completely unfair, that um, the, ho the whole thing's a bit of a hoax, and yet you still want to keep playing anyway. What are some of the spiritual approaches that we can take to keep working <laughs> and um, 
I'm going to give you three, and these are ones that I've encountered in my experience. And uh, these are, I'm going to present the promises and the pitfalls, the uh, the good sides and the bad sides of each of these approaches. And these are the three that I attempted and recognized that they don't work. So the first one is this approach of a kind of stoicism, a grim stoic philosophy of saying yes I will suffer the pains and horror of work and it's in some way a form of spiritual endeavor in itself to grow in emotional and physical strength by enduring the pain by enduring the hardship of this labor and incidentally interestingly from the biblical tradition from the Christian uh, religion. The original, the curse of Adam, the punishment that Adam uh, received as a punishment for eating of the tree of knowledge, eating the apple in the Garden of Eden, the punishment he received was that he must toil the field and receive no mana from heaven. He must suffer the thorns and spines of work and receive no heavenly reward on earth that his reward will come later it will come when when he dies and goes to to heaven but on earth you receive no no heavenly reward for your for your toil and i think this ingrains quite deeply in our psyche really i th- i think it's a natural inclination that we have what if we simply um, accept the pain of work as a as a a price that must be paid. So the pains of work are a price that must be paid in order to experience life. And there's a great deal of value in this in this understanding that we simply must endure work in order to enjoy leisure. In order to enjoy material reward, we must put the work in to um, our toil and our labor. And there's a a form of stoicism. So stoicism is a philosophy in which all is accepted and we accept and we face the the challenges and the adversity of life uh, and just accept what is it's not about avoiding it. It's also not about embracing, well, maybe embracing. It's, it's not about simply enduring. There is a sense of accepting. So stoicism is about the acceptance of the pain. It's not that you would wish for more pain, as is commonly misinterpreted with stoicism. It's not that you're trying to give yourself more adversity. It's that you're accepting the adversity that is already there. Now, what's the, the the downside of this? I did this for many years, the attempt at just pure stoicism, um, and ended up with a bad back. <laughs> ended up with a severe back injury. I was, I was the the downside of stoicism is that you you run the risk of wearing yourself into the ground. Because you can only brace yourself against pain for so long that you can only endure so much. This is as much as we'd like to believe that we're capable of transcending pain, you can't. You're only a a singular human organism at the end of the day, where you believe you are. (laughs) And so um, it's the uh, true spiritual recognition, true awakening and true spiritual insight isn't about trying, (laughs) finding a way to endure more pain unnecessarily. There's no real point in doing that. There is a form of spirituality called asceticism in which people put themselves through extreme deprivation, starvation, fasting, and sometimes even, you know, uh, flagellation, people sort of whipping themselves in the attempt to purify themselves spiritually through extreme pain, through extreme suffering in the idea that they will become, uh, they will become more spiritual. Uh, and in my experience, it just doesn't really work like that. <laughs> um, 
you'll just end up suffering more. And stoicism, this sort of grim endeavor that people take, like, uh, it, in my experience, it just strengthens the ego more. You end up taking on this persona of the martyr, of somebody who suffers for the greater good. And this can be a very attractive prospect. It's one approach. However, it is the approach of a singular, individual, finite, temporary, separate self that is still in the same trap of trying to <laughs> trying to get rid of pain by accepting it. And, um, well, you, you just end up suffering a little bit more. And you will, you will never feel like you're being recognized enough. And then for, for the, the, the courageous stand against pain that you're taking and you will never, it just, it, it, it's our, our natural inclination is to feel uncomfortable when there are, when we are in uncomfortable circumstances. So when you're at work, when you're taking the stoic approach, you're always hoping that one day one day you will have the level of strength to not feel pain anymore. But the, the problem there is in the approach itself, in that the moment that you're not feeling pain anymore, you just find the next level of pain to endure. And the approach itself facilitates that folly, that fallacy. The next approach, the second one, is... Um, this idea of find a job you love and you'll never work again. And I took this approach as well. I decided, well, I'm going to do a job I love, which is uh, I want to be in the fitness industry. <laughs> I want to work as a personal trainer because I love being in the gym and I love the environment and I love the people and I love the job. And there's this idea that a lot of people fall into this trap of they try to turn their hobby into a job in the hopes that the job will be as enjoyable as their hobby only to realize it doesn't work this way <laughs> so it's a good idea it's a really good idea and a lot of people go self-employed for this reason or or change careers for this reason because they enjoy something and therefore quite logically and quite reasonably conclude, well, if I made a career out of this, I would be happy all of the time because I've created, I'll, I'll have created a working life in which I'm just doing my job, my hobby. I'm just doing my entertainment. Only now I'm getting paid for it. Great idea. And I will say to an extent, it does work. So I, I was much happier as a personal trainer than I was as a teaching assistant at a social emotional behavioral disorder school. Far happier as a gym instructor, fitness instructor, and personal trainer. However, however, the crucial understanding here is that work is always going to be work. I'll get to this a little bit later on, but there's really no way around it. Work is work, and it doesn't matter if you enjoy the subject, you enjoy your work, you it, it's ordinarily your hobby, and now you're doing it as a job. Work is always going to be work, and it's not a case of you, you go into work and uh, you can just enjoy your hobby and get paid for it. There's always going to be problems around it you're still gonna have a boss or clients you're always gonna you're gonna come up against the same issues that are always there that are always there it doesn't matter what you do <laughs> in many ways it doesn't matter what you do it's the <laughs> work is work and you're always going to get the annoying emails you're always going to get the annoying customers you're always going to suffer the problems of your of your job of feeling like you're you're not doing a good job the feeling like you're doing a great job and not getting recognized enough the feeling that you're not being rewarded adequately for your work the fear that you uh, you won't be able to do your work uh, all of these issues all of these problems 
Find a job you love and you'll never work again. That is one way of trying to overcome the problem of work. Uh, however, that in the long run, that doesn't work either. Uh, because work is work, regardless of what you're doing. Work is always going to be uncomfortable by its definition, by its very own definition. The third approach that one can take from a spiritual perspective, and this is a very common trap that many uh, spiritual people fall into, is this concept of a, a kind of rising above everything and a feeling of, well, if I, if I get very spiritually awakened, if I become very present and very spiritually enlightened, then I'm not going to be bothered by anything anymore. Everything's just going to be absolutely fantastic and everything's going to be just fine. And I can go into work and suddenly uh, that uh, horribly narcissistic and abusive boss that I have, it won't bother me anymore because I'll just be fully awakened. I am the infinite universal consciousness and therefore I won't be bothered by the narcissistic abusive boss. I won't be bothered by these abusive customers. I won't be bothered by the relentless flood of emails demanding that I work harder. I won't be, I, I will have an infinite amount of energy and resources. And there's a sort of a belief that you will rise above all the problems of the earth <laughs> when you become uh, awakened and enlightened. Now, it's very true that the infinite universal consciousness doesn't suffer any of these problems and when you really get to it when you really get down to everything you do recognize on a very deep level that you are pure open empty spacious and clear perfectly happy in all circumstances all of the time that does happen. However, in my experience, trying to apply that <laughs> to the workplace simply doesn't work. Because you, you also add to this, then when you go to work and inevitably you get upset by, by something, you, you get stressed out and worn out and fed up, you now feel like this is a failure of your spiritual practice. You feel like you've let yourself down because you were supposed to be this uh, totally wise and uh, this, this fully above it all sort of sort of spiritual being. And yet you find yourself still worrying and still stressed and still anxious. And the, the attempt to eradicate difficulty from your life through spiritual practice then feels um, futile. It feels pointless. So the approach and attitude of sort of rising above everything. Again, there is a great deal of, of power in this. And these three approaches in themselves, the, this sort of, so we can take a bit of the stoicism approach we can change our job to be something that we're a bit more aligned with and we feel a bit more passion towards. And we can also apply spiritual endeavor, staying present, staying mindful, recognizing the infinite consciousness, dropping away of ego. All of these things together do alleviate massively the suffering associated with work. And for many people, that will be enough. We don't we don't need to go any further than that. It's just uh, all of your, your spiritual practice then and these approaches all together create a happier, more comfortable life that we can truly, truly enjoy, truly love, because that's what life is for. Ultimately, it's for loving. We don't have to enjoy it all the time but you can love life all the time. When it's good, when it's bad, when it's up, when it's down, everything simply becomes accepted as a part of the, the vast, wonderful tapestry of life experience, the, this, this incredible, marvellous play 
this wonderful experience of life. And it's going to be up, it's going to be down. That's going to happen. Sometimes it's the weekend, sometimes it's Monday morning. And there are through through the spiritual practice, you come to treat everything as one, everything as the same thing. So that's this this sort of approach, the grim stoicism, <laughs> finding a job you love and trying to rise above are the, the common ways that people try to overcome the pains of work. And yet at some level, finding okay, sooner or later, you realize you're just falling into the same trap. You've realized it's just it's the same thing. I wonder if you've ever had this experience. It's very similar to have you ever you've you've gotten a job you you've taken some action to try and improve your life and you succeed you get it you get the job or you get the qualification you manage to alter your life circumstances that you've you've planned you've predicted and you've worked towards changing your life to be happier and you get it you get the job you get the qualification something changes and you are happy. And all of a sudden you go, I've done it. I found it. I found that thing. I found the thing that I was searching for all along. I got it. And you want to run around telling everybody about it. You want to put it all over social media. You walk around with a smile on your face and you finally feel fulfilled. And you think this will go on for the rest of my life. I've I found the happiness and this is going to continue. And inevitably sooner or later something goes wrong the job you love you get a new boss and they're not as nice as the old boss or a new co-worker arrives and they start causing all kinds of problems uh the job itself changes it the job you started you loved but then people started meddling, people started interfering and um, and started adding things to your work role and changing what your work role is. Or maybe you, you suffer the, the terrible fate of being promoted. <laughs> and now you're in a management position and it's not even close to the job that you were doing. And not, not just that, you also realise being a manager isn't all it's cracked up to be. Maybe you were working towards that, thinking that a manager has a great job because they tell people what to do and then they go and do it. And then you realize, no, it's not that simple. Managers tell people what to do and then those people don't do it or don't do it right <laughs> or don't do it properly or thoroughly enough or don't do it in the way that the manager's manager wants them to do it. And so one of the worst things that can ever happen is you get promoted and yet that's the thing that you were working so hard to achieve. <laughs> oh dear. There really is no way around it, is there? You um eventually this this job that you thought would make you happy for whatever reason stops making you happy. Or maybe the job and people stay the same, but after two years, oh, it's like chewing gum. The flavor's just gone and you start feeling dissatisfied again. You start feeling, well, well, what's the what's the next thing? I don't feel challenged anymore. I don't feel fulfilled. And um, as time goes on, you you're maybe you're getting ill more often or picking up some health conditions. Maybe um maybe your work life balance isn't serving you anymore. And this is just very common. It's just very common that we 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 change our work life in order to be happy only to find that um, it, it just doesn't really, it doesn't really work like that. It never arrives. You never actually get there. That's the crazy thing. You, no matter how hard you work, you never actually arrive at that thing you're working towards. Even if, let's say, you have a long career and then retire, a lot of people have the experience of retiring and going, well, what the bloody hell was that all about? What I mean, I, I got it. I, I did the thing that I was asked to do. I worked my entire life and now I'm here and I just feel exactly the same as I always felt. I haven't I haven't actually achieved what I thought I would achieve. I don't have the things I thought I would have and I'm not happy. I don't have the happiness that I thought I would have. And this experience is is people 
intuitively understanding that something is amiss. Oh, the overall issue always comes down to this belief, the belief that you are an individual character, <laughs> that you are this character, and that at some point this character is going to find happiness. This character will will exist within a, a comfortable level of pain and will have achieved a comfortable level of success. The key, the key to this, the true key is simply to recognize the illusion for what it is. You can continue to play the character. You can continue to work. You can continue to do all the things that you ordinarily do. But once you have seen the illusion for what it is, it's no longer a problem for you. In exactly the same way that when you're watching a horror film and you have become entirely invested, it's terrifying. It's horrifying. It's quite uncomfortable watching a horror film. The relief that you feel when you remember that you're sat in a cinema and you're the audience, you realise that you're not the character you are the audience, you are the observer, you are the watcher. And the crucial thing is to recognise and understand that the film can continue, that let the film continue. In many ways, you simply recognise that this idea of choice is kind of an illusion. So one of the one of the key insights and recognitions that i had to truly find inner peace is that actually you're not in control at all and you would think that is a terrifying and depressing prospect but actually it's the most liberating thing of all you don't have a choice you you never did it's not it's not the individual that's doing all of this. In many ways, you are the, the character fulfilling the script. <laughs> You'll see this the more you meditate, the more you, you become spiritually awakened. And you see it in a weird kind of funny, roundabout, paradoxical sort of way that you don't letting go of control gives you control. Letting go of control gives you liberation that the car is driving itself. You don't have to drive. The car is driving itself. You can take your hands off the wheel and just enjoy the journey. Just enjoy the ride. And this feeling, I mean, I understand it on a deep level that you can't, everybody comes to this earth with a certain amount of work that they have to do. And regardless of what you choose to do with your life, you're going to have to do this work sooner or later. Even people who decide, I'm not going to work, I'm going to go live on the streets. The people living on the streets are working harder than anyone. If you Think of the work, think of the what you endure. If you think of work instead of an action, but as an endurance of pain, and think of work like that, in many ways, the, the, the word karma actually translates better to the word work than debt. Karma should mean work rather than debt. And if you think about the amount of work, therefore, that people on the streets are going through, it's extraordinary. And it because it, <laughs> I've tried to do this myself. I, I went self-employed as a personal trainer and a meditation coach and all of this. And a lot of that was trying to avoid work. And I just realized the more I try to avoid work, the more work I have to do. It takes an incredible amount of work in order to avoid work. <laughs> There's no getting away from it. Even if you tried to do nothing, it wouldn't be long until there's a lot of work that you have to do. And let's say you finally did it. You really, you said, to hell with the whole thing, I'm done. I want to just go live in a hut in the woods and live a simple life. Well, good luck with that. Because firstly, you'd have to find a hut. 
and then there's all the paperwork and finding the right people to talk to in order to find this and then you actually manage you've got to move there and that's going to take a lot of work and then you're finally there and the place needs doing up and that's going to be work and then you have to (laughs) you still have to sustain yourself and that's work and I'm telling you, you you go and finally find this <laughs> this way of not being bothered by anyone. You find an isolated cabin in the woods and actually start living there. It wouldn't be long until somebody has moved in next door. They just build a cabin right next to yours. And you'd say, why? Why did you have to build it there? Now I've got all these same old problems again of dealing with people. <laughs> You have to understand that there's no there's no way out. There's no way out. And this is not a depressing fact. It should liberate you because regardless of your choices, regardless of what you do, you're going to face the same problems, <laughs> the same work. You might as well enjoy it. You might as well enjoy it. And the biggest part of enjoying this journey and enjoying this work is by letting go of your control let go of the control you get yes you 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 even let go of the control of trying to feel better don't even try to feel better don't try to enjoy your work don't even accept it these are all just words and these are all just actions and words actions perspectives ideologies practices all of this is falling into the same trap of the ego, the individual, temporary, finite, separate self trying to control the world, trying to force the external world into a shape that it can enjoy, (laughs) that it can be free from suffering. But the only way to be free from suffering is to be free of the illusion now they say in the Hindu tradition, so Maya is uh, the illusion. This uh, sometimes, I mean, you know, there's there's a a resurgence in the interest in the concept of the matrix, of the uh, being being plugged into a simulation, and it's very similar to what the Hindus said with the concept of the Maya, the illusion. We're all actors playing out this illusion, and when you finally unplug from the matrix and wake up from the illusion, one of the most surprising things is recognizing that the illusion remains. The only thing that changes is that you now know that it's an illusion. You've, you've seen it for what it is, and yet the play continues. You remember you're watching a film, but the film continues, and now you can enjoy it even more. It's like completing a computer game. A video game. You get to the end level, you beat the final boss, and now you can go and replay all of the levels (laughs) with all of the skills, experiences, and powers that you gained throughout the game. And now you can go back and keep playing it. True liberation comes from seeing the Maya for what it, the illusion for what it is. And Yes, when you're deep into meditative states, you're, you've turned the computer game off. You've turned the film off. And the longer amount of time that you can spend doing that, the better. It, the, the moment that you're not at work, because obviously when, when you're at work, it's very difficult to stay present. One of the natures, the, the nature of work is that your attention is demanded. You, you are, your attention is being forced onto uh, things that you would rather not pay attention to. That really is the nature of work. You're being, your attention is directed towards something uncomfortable. And so it's very difficult to stay present, to keep your attention on the present moment, to keep your attention on consciousness itself is obviously going to be difficult at work. But the moment you're out of work, The moment your attention is not demanded elsewhere, turn that attention towards the present. Turn that attention towards attention itself, consciousness. And the more time you can spend in that state, the more your natural insights will arise. 
And once this level of inner peace has been found, you will find the external world begins to change automatically. Things just don't bother you so much anymore. Things just fall away. The Sunday scaries disappear. You're just not bothered anymore. You you don't get this pit in your stomach on Monday morning because everything becomes the same thing. It's just a different colour on the screen at that time, at that moment. It's just a shift in the experience. That's all. That's all. Whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're at rest, whether you're at play, whether you are suffering terrible pain or total bliss, you recognise truly and deeply you're only ever here and it's only ever now. There is no work. Not really. It's just a happening. The, the entire human race is the illusion of work unfolding. And once you remove yourself from this, you're, be- you're beginning to remove the karmic debt from humanity. It's one of the greatest endeavours that you can partake of. Take yourself out of the game. <laughs> Remove yourself from the illusion and you remove a huge, huge karmic debt from the common pot of humanity. And this is an enormous relief. Enormous. So that's the problem of work and some of the perspectives and uh, insights in, in how to overcome. How to overcome. Yeah. Because just because you're the infinite universal consciousness doesn't mean your boss knows that. (laughs) <laughs> and you can't go into work and say uh, uh sorry no or you can't ring up and say i'm sorry um i'm not going to come in today because um it's only ever the present moment and um there's no such thing as work and i'm a i'm an illusory temporary finite separate self and i'm not going to come in today but still pay me if you would please that'd be great and um i'll see you when i see you but i'm above it all now i wish it worked like that but it just doesn't That's the power of now what? Episode two. If you enjoy and benefit from my meditations and talks, please consider becoming a, a paid subscriber. It's only two ninety nine a month. And um, that's sort of less than the price of a coffee these days. It goes a long way to supporting me and my work. Uh, you can always hit the follow button and um, there's a there's you can give me some stars as well if you feel like it. And I'll put a Q and A at the end of this if you want to. Uh, if you want me to speak on any particular topic or any particular subject relating to spiritual awakening, the problems that spiritual awakening can present, uh, please feel free to ask the question in the Q and A section. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, be well, and stay present. <laughs>